How could they? Lidl doesn't own it. It's the property of an offshore company based in the Caribbean. When we tell shoppers, they are astonished and confused. And they try to figure out why. Why do you think they've set up this structure with the offshore corporation? Das macht man ja meistens dann, zumindest stellt man sich das so vor, wenn irgendwelche linken Geschäfte dabei sind. Damit er keine Steuern zahlen muss wahrscheinlich, wenn es illegal ist. Im Prinzip blicken wir als Normalbürger gar nicht mehr dadurch, wem was gehört und äh, wer hier was macht. We've figured it out. The property belongs to an offshore company called Gondor Enterprises. There are more offshore companies behind it and a businessman in India. This structure can reduce tax bills. It's exposed by secret files belonging to a large law firm in Panama. The firm specializes in offshore companies. A whistleblower has leaked over 11 million documents to journalists. Among them are 4.5 million emails. The data reveals legal activity, but also dubious and criminal business dealings. It involves the super rich. It involves despots and criminals. It also involves politicians and people close to them, including at least 12 current and former heads of state, from Argentina, Ukraine and Saudi Arabia, for example. The Icelandic Prime Minister is already coming under intense pressure. The League provides a look into the innermost workings of a company that operates in complete secrecy, Mossack Fonseca in Panama. With 48 branches around the world, it is one of the very biggest. The law firm has established more than 200,000 offshore companies. The real owners of those companies can now be revealed. At the very top of the law firm is a German, Jürgen Mossack, a lawyer without a conscience. Over a year ago, a whistleblower contacted the Süddeutsche Zeitung newspaper. These are the questions the journalists posed to him. Munich, September 2015. Journalists from around the world have flown in to talk about an enormous project, the Panama Papers. The whistleblower provided the Süddeutsche with a vast amount of data. The journalists at the paper then passed the data on to the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists in Washington. There, reporting was divided up among over 100 newsrooms across the globe. The project continued in strict secrecy over the course of months. The conference in Munich was initiated by two journalists from the Süddeutsche Zeitung. Das sind keine Nischenthemen, sondern das sind Themen, die jeden von uns was angehen, nämlich wofür werden Steueroasen genutzt? Wofür, wofür braucht man das und welches Klientel benutzt sowas? Na ja, das liegt zeigt, wie, wie sich eine Parallelstruktur etabliert hat in der Welt sozusagen, in der sich die die mächtigen bewegen, in der sich aber auch sehr Viele Figuren bewegen, die einfach was zu verstecken haben. With the help of Jürgen Mossack, when the whistleblower took up contact, he asked. The first example is local, but it's enough to expose the duplicity of the globally operating firm Mossack von Sicker. We take a trip through northern Germany to Wilhelmshaven. Olympia was once a giant, one of the largest typewriter manufacturers in the world. At its peak, it employed 20,000 workers, but things went downhill in the middle of the 1990s. The Hong Kong-based company Elite bought a part of Olympia. Elite then diverted that part called the Olympia Office Vertriebsgesellschaft into one of the offshore corporations maintained by Mossack Fonseca on the British Virgin Islands. It's called Olympia International Holding. 
The move meant that the company was no longer obligated to pay company pensions to Olympia retirees. The fact that a higher regional court in Oldenburg found that the company was legally required to pay the pensions meant nothing. An email from the leaked documents in which Mossack Fonseca reassures its concerned client. We can confirm that Germany is not on the list of countries with which the BVI has entered in reciprocal enforcement agreements. Insolvency lawyer Alexander Narashevsky has been trying for nine years now to force Elite to pay the Olympia workers' pensions, to no avail. We were the first to show him the Mossack Fonseca email. Also eigentlich ist das ungeheuerlich, weil man hier versucht, ähm, berechtigte Ansprüche äh, dort die Gläubiger auflaufen zu lassen. Eigentlich werden die bösen Absichten da ganz deutlich. Welche Funktion hat der What role does this Shell Company on the British Virgin Islands actually play in the dispute over the pensions of the former Olympia employees? Für die ehemaligen Olympia beschäftigt. Die Funktion liegt ganz klar, eine Brandmauer zu ziehen, dass im Endeffekt Vermögensgegenstände in dieser Gesellschaft bleiben und dann berechtigte Ansprüche abgewehrt werden. A visit to former Olympia Works Council member Joachim Urbanek. Herr Urbanek? Hallo, ja. Guten Christoph Lüttger, ja, guten, guten Tag. Guten Tag. Guten Olympia was my life, he still gushes enthusiastically. And he still has a few keepsakes at home. Urbanek admits that for years he was unable to see through the deceit of the elite corporation. You suddenly belonged to a holding company based on the British Virgin Islands. What was your reaction at the time? Das hatte ich eigentlich erst dann im Laufe der Jahre herausgestellt, dass das eigentlich keine richtige Strategie gewesen ist, sondern dass das eben eine eine Briefkastenfirma ist, worauf eigentlich niemand richtig Zugriff hat. Es ist nur der finanzielle Aspekt gewesen, dass man gesagt mal sehen, was da noch ist, was dann noch da noch why do you think the buyer chose to create this offshore structure? Mitarbeitern, es ist schon eine Sauerei, wenn man überlegt, was da für, für Gelder verschoben werden oder, oder äh, nicht, nicht gezahlt werden. Because the Shell Company simply refuses to pay, a retirement insurance company had to get involved. Elite did not respond to our requests for comment. As deplorable as the situation with Olympia is, Mossack Fonseca also serves clients who are in a completely different league. Warlords, arms dealers, despots. Some of Mossack Fonseca's clients have been the target of sanctions from the EU and the US. One of them is Rami Makhlouf, cousin of the Syrian dictator Assad. Only years after the US imposed penalties on Makhlouf did Mossack Fonseca discontinue the relationship. Prior to that, it showed no scruples. The company's justification can be found in an internal email. If HSBC headquarters in England do not have an issue with a client, then I think we can also accept him. The data also reveal how the Azerbaijan dictator Aliyev enriches himself at the country's expense. His two daughters own at least seven shell companies set up by Mossack. They possess the mining concessions for the Azerbaijani gold mines. Members of the Italian Mafia are also among Mossack Fonseca's clients. There are also several Latin American drug barons like Maiori Chacon Rossell, the cocaine supplier for the brutal Los Zetas cartel, who was arrested two years ago. And Mossack Fonseca knows exactly who its clients are, such as Rafael Caro Quintero, one of the most feared drug barons in Mexico, a man who was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Jürgen Mossack personally looked after a shell company associated with Quintero. In one email he writes, Pablo Escobar was a baby compared to Rafael Caro Quintero. I would not want to be one of those he goes looking for when he gets out of prison.
Jürgen Mossack and his Panamanian partner Ramon Fonseca, the two of them lead the law firm that carries their names. They devise, sell and administer the offshore companies. In an effort to find them, we catch a flight to Panama. We are in the Panama Banking District. Right next door is one of the best and most expensive residential areas of the city. This is where he is supposed to live. The house is heavily secured. The guard who is quick to confront us is armed. What are you doing here? He asks in Spanish. Hello? But he also understands uh, German. Is Herr Mossack zu Hause? Yeah. Is, is Herr Mr. Mossack, Mossack at home? Can we speak with Mr. Mossack? Christoph Lütgert. Can we talk to him? Alemania. Christoph Lütgert from Germany. Yeah. German television. Also, hier wohnt er. So, he lives here. The guard promises to ask Mossack. Mossack's house is a fortress. Surveillance, cameras, razor wire and an electric fence. Mercedes, BMW, Lexus. I was able to get a quick glimpse of three luxury cars in the garage. Mossack, we had been told by people who know him well, lives completely secluded, in the shadows. But some information about him can be found on the internet. Jürgen Mossack was born in Bavaria and emigrated to Panama with his parents when he was still in school. Now married to his third wife, Mossack founded the firm in 1977. His partner Fonseca is extremely well connected and has even become an advisor to the Panamanian president. Both of them, Mossack and Fonseca, share a penchant for extremely high aspirations. We have obtained an internal company video from its 35th anniversary. My vision is that uh, our company become an organization that is really, really not only well respected, but which is an organization similar to perhaps Microsoft in a much smaller scale, of course. Y dentro de otros 30 años, otros 60, 90 años, estaremos todavía en el mundo como una empresa sólida y fuerte. Esa es la herencia que queremos dejar a nuestro país, a nuestra familia y al mundo. Panama is the ideal place for people like Mossack and Fonseca. It's a place where their services are both appreciated and supported. Economic policy in Panama is essentially designed so that shell company providers can operate successfully. Adolfo Linares, a lawyer and former president of the Chamber of Commerce, is close friends with the German. Mossack, uh, describe him as, uh, how important is he as a lawyer here in, in Panama? German Mossack is, a, an, is an excellent attorney. I know him personally well. He's a, a very honest person who's being attacked. I don't know why. And I believe he's a well uh, and a valuable, a valuable member of Panamanian society, both professionally and socially. And I, I can recommend his law firm 100%. He is also specialized in, in offshore constructions. What, what do you think of offshore constructions? It's a, it's a legal business like any other service that is being provided uh, to clients. It's like uh, if you go to the, you want to buy shoes, or you want to go to the doctor, and you want to go to the tax lawyer, or you want to go to a, you want to structure. Every, every man has the right to structure his finances uh, in a matter 
that it fits best. As you certainly know, uh, the discussion uh, concerning offshore construction is very critical. Why? Because Why is critical? What money laundering, but, okay, corruption, but, 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 I mean, wait, wait, hiding wait, wait, wait. money. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay, okay. So we have to close banks because the banks are used for money laundering. So then we have to we have to shut down the use of knife because knife can be used for stabbing. So do you see that because those many 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 that are probably less than one percent of the of the user of offshore corporate structure, then you have to penalize the 99.9 percent .9 of the of the of the correct users of offshore corporates because those 0.1 do it on a bad way. That's absurd too. That's also absurd because if, if under that rationalization we should ban anything, but let's let's ban everything then. 99.9% .9 of those with offshore companies are correct users, Linares claims. But what we found in the Mossack Fonseca data is pretty bad. Our next example comes from Africa. The central figure is a certain Benny Steinmetz, an Israeli diamond trader worth several billion dollars, who for a time owned a stake in German department store chain Karstadt. At home in Israel, Steinmetz and his gracious wife present themselves as philanthropists. From their billions, they diverted a few million to help children. They even made a video praising their own generosity. Every dollar invested in young children is worth eight to ten dollars at a later age. We are doing something contributing to society. But the data from Panama exposes the self-proclaimed hero as a villain. His company, with its countless shell companies over the years, is a major client of Mossack Fonseca. We head to West Africa, to Guinea, one of the poorest countries in the world. Here, of all places, is where Steinmetz sought to put together a mega deal to rob the country of its natural resources. Regardless of the consequences and regardless of its effect on children, whose fate he is allegedly so concerned about in Israel. The deal focused on Simandu, the largest unexploited iron ore reserves in the world. Steinmetz wanted to secure the mining concession so a middleman approached Mamadi Touré, the fourth and favorite wife of Guinea's dictator at the time. The two reached an agreement. To execute the deal, they had Mossack Fonseca establish the shell companies Pendler and Matinda Partners. Several million dollars were to flow through the firms to Mamadi Touré. In return for the bribe, the first lady got her husband, the dictator, to give the coveted mining rights to the Israeli billionaire. After just a few months, Steinmetz sold half of the gifted rights on to a Brazilian company for the astonishing sum of two and a half billion dollars, a downright criminal return. The new democratic government of Guinea has since established a commission that has looked into the scandal. Mamadou Taran Diallo is part of it. À la lecture de ces contrats qu'il y a entre Mamadi Touré, Berger et ses de sociétés intermédiaires et d'écran, on s'aperçoit qu'il y a des pratiques uniquement de trafic d'influence et de corruption. Why do you think the two sides got these offshore, these fake companies involved? Finalement, au bout, vous avez vu qu'est-ce qu'on arrive? C'est Berger qui arrive enfin. Le reste, c'est des sociétés écrans, euh, des trucs par lesquels on est passé pour arriver à un but bien précis. C'est la pratique souvent, <rire> si vous voulez, des sociétés, comme je vous disais tout à l'heure, écrans. C'est-à-dire qu'on cache quelque chose derrière pour finalement apparaître au grand jour. 
Would you say that Guinea was completely swindled by Benny Steinmetz's company? The new government has withdrawn the Simandou mining concession from Steinmetz. He denies any wrongdoing and says he didn't bribe anybody. The dispute is now before an international court. But Steinmetz has already received the first 500 million dollar payment from the sale of the concession. And the bitterly poor country of Guinea still hasn't earned anything from its own natural resources. Establishing shell companies to carry out such shady deals is quite simple. I tried it for myself. To prevent Mossack Fonseca from learning anything at all about our reporting, I called a different firm that specializes in such things. I am interested in establishing one of those firms with you. I wanted to ask, is it very complicated or relatively simple? Founding a company is relatively simple. So tell me, what exactly are the advantages of the kinds of offshore companies you are offering? What does asset protection mean? That nobody can get to it? No accounting requirements, no balance sheet requirements, good. That's a benefit, certainly. Listen, I have some money that I want to park somewhere. Yes, I understand that you don't provide tips for tax optimization. And does my name appear? With regards to the company, does my name appear or does it not? In your records, that's clear. And with the bank too, of course. I am the beneficial owner. But externally, only the name of my company appears. Good. Then I've got the info I need. Thank you very much and I will get back to you if I need to. Thank you. It is really extremely simple to establish an offshore company on your computer at home. Just like with all online transactions, you are asked to fill out an order form template. A couple of clicks, some basic personal information and then I'm asked to come up with a company name. I choose Antje Overseas. I then transfer 3000 euros online. And a couple of days later, I receive the official confirmation. I am the proud owner the beneficial owner of my own shell company. Now that I have my own shell company, I want to learn more about such structures from an expert. A well-known Frankfurt attorney, who doesn't sell such companies, but who is one of the most accomplished banking and finance lawyers in Germany, has made the trip to Hamburg. Dr. Carsten Rand immediately makes it clear that shell companies always make it seem like something fishy is going on. I decided to try it out myself and went online and established an offshore company in Panama, Antje Overseas. Is doing such a thing so normal that all you have to do is a couple of clicks and you have an offshore company? Also, das ist einfach möglich. Es gibt eine ganze Industrie, die, die versucht, diese Treuhandstrukturen anzubieten. For me, as a layperson, there are some odd elements to the whole thing. Sometimes I get mail from Panama, sometimes from an address in Cyprus, and then from one in the United Arab Emirates. And all of this correspondence is about this company that I only just founded. Ja, das ist der Versuch, möglichst große Intransparenz zu schaffen und äh, möglichst viele Nebelkerzen zu streuen, damit nicht deutlich wird, wer tatsächlich hinter diesem Vermögen steckt. Aber meine Gesellschaft. But my offshore corporation has a real address. Look. Adresse hier. 50. Straße, so und so, das Haus so und so, der und der Stock in Panama City. 
Ich vermute mal, dass unter dieser Adresse einige hundert oder tausend Gesellschaften residieren. Das wäre ein typisches Muster. Und dann And then I've already received the minutes of an extraordinary meeting of the Board of Directors on January 22nd in Panama City. The meeting started at 9 a.m. and ended punctually at 10 a.m. You can sense immediately that something's not quite right. Es soll hier auf dem Papier der Eindruck erweckt werden, diese Gesellschaft tut etwas, diese Ver Gesellschaft verwaltet Vermögen oder ist in irgendeiner Weise aktiv. Tatsächlich ist das aber nicht der Fall. The entire system is based on obfuscation. That's how you have to look at it. My wealth, in inheritance perhaps, or illegal income, is to be made invisible. When I founded Antje Overseas, a bank account based in Panama, or the Caribbean, or perhaps Africa, was also part of the deal. With a credit card attached to this account, I can access my concealed money from anywhere in the world without leaving a trail, even in Germany. My name doesn't appear anywhere in the bank statement. It only says Antje Overseas. How is such a thing possible? To the outside world, it looks as though three, four directors manage Antje Overseas. But these directors don't even have to be real people. They can also be shell companies. I can use my company Antje Overseas to hide, transfer or conceal wealth. Only the bank that holds the account and the shell corporation's operating company, such as Mossack Fonseca, knows that Christoph Lütgert in Hamburg is behind Antje Overseas. But as crazy as the structures behind Antje Overseas might seem, they are entirely legal in Panama. The journey through Mossack Fonseca's shadowy realm of offshore companies heads east, to Russia. The data uncovers veiled ploys by banks, companies and people, with links to Vladimir Putin. St. Petersburg, Putin's birthplace and hometown. The center of the personality cult that surrounds him. Putin, Putin. That is Putin, yes. Yeah, these are Putin. Putin und. The Russian leader's image is constantly stage managed, not just for state propaganda, but also for tourists and ordinary people. You'll find Putin as a wooden matryoshka doll with all the others in sight. Putin's likeness is on caps and t-shirts. Putin the patriot, Putin the hero, Putin the superman, athletic, burly, tough and heroic. Putin loves this image, but when it comes to money he prefers a more frugal one. He tells his people that he earns just over $12,000 a month. It's a claim that can and should be doubted if you listen to the opposition whose claims, to the contrary, are made at great risk. The opposition has long suspected that Putin is surrounded by a network of kleptocrats, a loyal clique of billionaires who enrich themselves shamelessly at the country's expense. We make a nighttime visit to Ilya Yashin one of Russia's most important opposition figures. How would you describe the system and what are its distinctive traits? Такую сверхкасту в нашей стране, касту неприкосновенных. Если э, результатом того, что ты находишься во главе страны, становится обогащение, последовательное обогащение твоих друзей, это значит, что у тебя существует конфликт интересов. How rich do you think Putin is? Are there estimates? Огромное количество людей живет за чертой бедности, больше 20 миллионов. Но верхушка России, руководство России, окружение Путина и сам Путин 
купаются в роскоши все годы пребывания у власти. Это стало возможным благодаря полному отсутствию контроля со стороны гражданского общества, со стороны парламента. Для того, чтобы собрать доказательства, необходимо полноценное следствие, необходимо полноценное парламентское расследование. И я убежден, что поскольку этих людей давно уже никто не контролирует, любое расследование установит значительные факты коррупции в путинском окружении. The Mossack Fonseca data leak reveals new insights into the complex financing system used by those at the very top of Russian society. Confidence of Putin appeared to have cycled two billion dollars through offshore companies. Even for those well informed on the subject, one name that pops up in the data comes as a complete surprise. It is that of Russian star cellist Sergei Roldugin. We attend one of his concerts in St. Petersburg. Roldugin, the artist and musician, but perhaps more important is the fact that he is a close friend of Vladimir Putin from his university days. He is also the godfather of Putin's oldest daughter. Roldugin likes to say that he's just a musician and not a businessman. But the data from Mossack Fonseca shows that Roldugin owns two shell companies, International Media Overseas and Sonnet Overseas. Russia's Rossiya Bank ordered the two companies on his behalf from Mossack Fonseca. It's the very bank that is considered to be Putin's bank of choice. It has been slapped with sanctions from the US and the EU. Roldugin also holds options on shares in the Russian automobile and defense company Kamas. And through international media overseas, the Russian cellist also owned 12.5% of the Russian company Video International, an extremely lucrative enterprise that dominates the Russian advertising market. These are astounding connections for a musician. But he's not just a musician. He's a longtime friend of Putin's. In Russia, the only people familiar with the Mossack Fonseca data are journalists at Novaya Gazeta. The Moscow newspaper is famous for its fearlessness and its unflinching reporting. The paper has won numerous international prizes and its journalists do not shy away from challenging the country's most powerful people. Roman Anin has been covering Putin for years. He says he has been electrified by the leaked data. What role do offshore companies play? What function do they serve in the system? Putin often stresses his rejection of shell companies. He also portrays his friends as patriotic business people working to achieve Russia's goals. But the data shows that this is a lie. Friends of his are active offshore. We can now say for the first time that journalists around the world have succeeded in getting a step closer to the Russian president's money. We knew about most of the people before, but no one had been aware of Roldugin's ties. It raises suspicion. Is Roldugin serving as a straw man for Putin? There is no proof. But his companies were still active just a few years ago. That much can be seen by Rodugin's signatures on dated documents. He rejected all of our requests for an interview. Putin also declined to respond. Only his spokesman has answered, claiming the existence of an international media conspiracy. Panama. Just a few minutes' drive away from our hotel is the address where my own shell company is supposed to be. 
The drive takes us through the banking district to Global Plaza Tower. Is it a huge building? It is. The data shows that over a thousand Germans also use shell companies from Mossack Fonseca. No politicians are among them, but there are some prominent figures like Formula One driver Nico Rosberg. For whatever reason, he uses it for business with Mercedes and says it is a private matter. Also included is the controversial chicken magnate Anton Pohlmann, as well as former Siemens executives who apparently misappropriated company money. Numerous German banks are also part of Mossack Fonseca's business model. The data prove how closely German financial institutions have worked together with a Panamanian law firm, including Berenberg Bank and Deutsche Bank. They deny having acted illegally. But Commerzbank, HSH Nordbank and Hypovereinsbank have reached a deal with public prosecutors to pay millions in fines for aiding and abetting tax evasion. Now I'm actually part of the offshore world. After all, I have my own shell company, Antje Overseas. Its offices are supposed to be located here, in the Global Plaza Tower. At first, they don't want to let me in, probably because they have never seen anyone idiotic enough to take this game seriously. I want to go to the 19th floor. In any case, there is confusion in the lobby over the fact that I actually want to go to my office. Anti overseas. Here you can see it's my company. But you see, I have an office here. My company, it's, everything is written here. So, and it's. Okay. It's, I, in the 19th floor, I go up, okay? At some point, the doorman caves in to my insistence and lets me back. But the floor plan down in the lobby shows that my 19th floor is suspiciously empty. Sweetheart. So, now I'm excited. I'm going to see my office. What I find on the 19th floor exceeds or falls far short of all my expectations. It's a spacious void with a fantastic view of Panama's banking district. It would actually make a nice office. It's totally empty. But when I Google my address, I get 6,000 search results for all kinds of companies, all of which allegedly have their offices here. In jedem Fall eine gute Lage. Either way, great location. Also for poker companies, nail studios or shell companies from Uzbekistan. So here on the 19th floor of the Global Plaza Tower is where my Antje Overseas is supposed to be. I've walked through the empty rooms, run down and in need of renovation. It's impossible to see what they are going to do with it. There's a law firm at the very end of the hallway where a woman is sitting all alone. Maybe she can tell me where my apartment H, Sweet H, is located. Can you tell me? This is my company, Anti Overseas. And I got everything from the lawyer. Where is Sweet H? Is this Sweet H? So you have, is this my company? No, uh, uh, we are just the resident agent. A resident agent. You see, I have been written here in Suite H, in the 19th floor, my company is based. So I'm the proprietor of this company. So I, I, want, I want to talk to somebody about, about the business, what can we do, what are the next steps. So that's the reason why I'm here in Panama. I enjoy pretending to be naive. I drive the woman at the reception to the brink of despair. And how many shell companies are administered by the small law firm she really can't say. Uh, she asks me to write an email. Strange. Thank you. Bye.
Here, on the empty floor of a shell company that I could use to engage in the dirtiest and most lucrative activities without anyone back home noticing. I'm beginning to understand Mossack's business model better and better. What is it that links Mossack Fonseca and this man with a soft, youthful face? Icelandic Prime Minister Gunnlaugsson with a shell company, Wintress. We travel to the northernmost edge of Europe to find out. It turns out that Mossack Fonseca has also left deep marks here too. In Iceland, of all places. There's a memorial right in the center of the capital city, Reykjavik, unintentionally commemorating the hubris of a year in which any concern about money was thrown out of the window. It's an architecturally spectacular opera house and conference hall, but also extravagantly large for a country of only 320,000 people. The mass protests of 2008 till 2009 are still etched into the collective memory, unforgotten even today. That's when the bubble burst and most Icelanders lost lots of money. The three largest banks were playing in the big leagues and amassing 75 billion euros in debt with their reckless lending policies. The country was on the verge of bankruptcy. The Mossack Fonseca data now reveals the current Prime Minister Gunnlaugsson and his wife set up the shell company Wintress right at the peak of the banking boom. The wealthy couple bought just under $4 million worth of shares of Icelandic banks. They wanted a seat at the table for the giant game of Monopoly taking place at the time. The Prime Minister kept all of this secret from the people of Iceland. He sold his Wintress stake to his own wife. As a private citizen, she is not required to disclose such information to Parliament. Like all other investors after the big crash, she lodged claims against the banks, which have since been nationalized. She is a creditor owed close to $4 million. Her husband, meanwhile, is responsible for deciding what happens next with the banks. It's a problematic tangle of interests. All of that was to have been kept under wraps forever. And it worked for quite some time. But the Mossack data trail extends all the way to Iceland. We paid a visit to Johannes Christiansson, the only journalist in Reykjavik who has been briefed on the data. He has a reputation for being a tenacious investigative reporter. He lives far outside the city in an unassuming residential development. Christoph is my name. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Thank you. It may seem excessive, but Johannes covers his windows when working on the story. He worries that someone outside might be able to discover his reporting. Do you feel isolated? Lonely? I feel isolated because I can't tell anyone about this story, because uh, Iceland is a small country and uh, that, uh, I mean, this is, this is really important. This is the biggest story I have ever worked on. If this comes public now, what could be the consequences? I think, you know, when people see what went on behind the curtain, I mean, people will get angry, but uh, I think the business elite and the, and the political elite in Iceland, they will hate me. What do you expect, how will he react if you confront the Prime Minister with your research? He will either deny it or he will have some explanation. But at least he has to answer the question, why did you form an offshore company to buy bonds in the, in the, in the Icelandic banks? A few days ago, the showdown in Reykjavik 
Together with Swedish television, which also has been made privy to the data, Johannes has an appointment for an interview with the Prime Minister. At first, Johannes stays in the background. His Swedish colleague was to begin with friendly small talk, like usual. But then, quite soon, a warning shot. What do you personally think about people and companies that are using, well, tax havens for hiding assets, for example? Well, in, in Iceland, like in most Nordic societies, or all Nordic societies, I suppose, we attach a lot of importance to everybody paying his uh, share, because uh, we have a, a big... Uh, well, well, society is, is seen as a big project that everybody needs to take part in. So when somebody is, uh, is cheating the rest of society, it is taken very seriously in Iceland. What about yourself, uh, Mr. Prime Minister? Have you or did you have any connections yourself to an offshore company? Uh, myself? No. Well, uh, the... Uh, I have always uh, given all of my assets and that of my family up for, for the taxes. So uh, there has never been any, any of me as I, my assets hidden anywhere. And uh, it's, a, it's an unusual question for, <laughs> for an Icelandic politician to get. It's almost like being uh, accused of, of something. But uh, I, can, I can confirm that uh, I have never hidden any of my assets. So the case is that you have never had whatsoever any connection to an offshore company yourself? As I say, uh, my uh, assets have always been um, up on the table. Mr. Prime Minister, what can you tell me about a company called Vintris? Well, uh, um, it's a company, if I, if I recall correctly, which is associated with one of the companies that I uh, was on a board of. And uh, it was uh, ha had an account, which, as I as I mentioned, has been uh, with the tax uh, uh, on the tax account uh, since it was established. So uh, now I'm starting to feel a, a bit strange about these questions because it's like you are accusing me of something when you are asking me about a, con a company that uh, has been but, but, but on my uh, tax return. Yeah, from but the I, I, it's, it must be okay for me as a journalist to ask the yes, Prime Minister about personal... Certainly, but, but, uh, but you are indicating that I have not paid uh, taxes on it. Then Johannes joins the discussion and the Prime Minister has trouble maintaining his composure. He stands up and lays into him. What you are asking is nonsense. You set me up. Johannes responds, why did you never disclose it? Did the Prime Minister really tell the truth in the interview? He claimed he was always open about his holdings. But nobody knew about them until the data leak at Mossack Fonseca. The results of our visit to Panama we didn't get the chance to speak to Jürgen Mossack, the founder, seller and operator of countless offshore companies. All requests were met with meaningless responses and we were denied all requests for interviews. No answers were provided about Mossack's dubious clients, the drug bosses, warlords, diamond merchants, government leaders and their friends and dictator cronies. They and thousands of others can be found in the Mossack Fonseca client data made public through the leak. <laughs> Television teams from Europe, America and Australia have all traveled to Panama because of the leak data. Mossack has managed to hide from all of them. We all walk over to his headquarters together. Yes, now we are going to try all together. Will we finally be able to get Mr. Mossack to react? So far he hasn't responded with anything of substance. He's done nothing more than try to brush us off with excuses. 
So let's see if he comes out this time. So mal sehen, ob er jetzt rauskommt. Wie viele Teams sind wir? How many teams we are? How many crews? Seven? Seven, I guess. Six. 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 Nadie me va a atender. Pero ¿por qué no me habían dicho? Pero usted me acaba de decir que no nos van a atender. Yo quiero saber quién le dijo que no nos va a atender. ¿Qué persona? ¿No sabe? So we don't get any further. The door remains shut. I dial the number of Mossack Fonseca's spokesman. His secretary answers. May I talk to Mr. Carlos Sousa? Can you perhaps go in the meeting and tell him that a group of around 20 or 25 international journalists is in front of your building? So please go in the meeting, tell him we are waiting here. Of course, we would wait also another 30 or 60 or 70 minutes. Uh, we have time, but I think it's in both interests if he would come down earlier. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. A short time later, the spokesman actually does appear. Nonchalant, elegant and eloquent. We've been familiar with the central claims of the press statement for some time. It is repeated constantly. Mossack Fonseca is proud of its activities, it doesn't violate the laws of any country and it doesn't participate in any money laundering. And if they find any criminals or other questionable figures among their clients, they drop them immediately. The letter, though, was drafted before Mossack Fonseca knew that private company data had been leaked. Just as Jürgen Mossack had, Ramon Fonseca also rebuffed all requests for an interview. Instead, he used local television to make a spirited appearance. Como una fábrica de automóviles, una fábrica de automóviles construye un vehículo, un carro. Una sociedad es un vehículo, un vehículo legal para comprar apartamentos, para hacer transacciones, para tener cuentas de banco. Nosotros, los abogados, creamos las sociedades, las construimos como una fábrica construye un carro y las vendemos. Nosotros no somos responsables de qué se hace con esa sociedad. Es como si se acusara a una fábrica de carros de un atropello o de que el carro se usó para un robo. But on the day after the crowd of journalists appeared before the company's headquarters, Ramon Fonseca resigned from his office as an advisor to Panama's president in order, as he explained, to prevent damage to himself, his company and his country.